What is your, I better get the of here now because some is about to go down story? Story one. I picked up a buddy of mine at the train station and we went on our way with the other couple hundred people that arrived in the same train. There had been talk of artists performing free of charge at the old football grounds, and the police had set out a route to said grounds, so we followed only to arrive at an empty field with nothing to do. Naturally, everyone left soon and walked towards the city center, where we honestly had a good party. People brought cars, opened the doors, and blasted music through the speakers. We were just standing around listening to music and having a few drinks, and even locals joined in. After a couple of hours, we heard noise from down the street and quickly figured out that it were people starting riots. So we got out of there immediately and took a big detour to prevent getting stuck in the riots ourselves. The next day, we saw videos and pictures of the riots and looting and were very happy we left in time. Story two, went to a local warehouse rave, which asterisk initially asterisk seemed surprisingly legit for a warehouse rave. They had security claimed a permit to operate past 2 a.m., and had an 18-plus side and 21-plus side that served liquor. After a couple of hours, I start to realize that this may be a little out of control. The 18-plus room is unbearably hot, and people are slumping down walls like gunshot victims. Two acquaintances I happened to meet informed me happily they just did a ton of acid out of a stranger's eyedropper. Yes, they're stupid. As I'm contemplating whether it's time to bounce or not, a friend texts me, Vandals. Get the fudge out before you are trapped asterisk. I have no idea about vandals, but I got the second bit. So I grab my tripping idiots, because I'm too nice to abandon their dumb asses, and head out the front door. And right into a cop convention. A dozen squad cars have swarmed the building, most attendees still inside and unaware of the police. We are, of course, immediately grabbed and questioned on sight. I summon my soberest, whitest, leave it a beaverous face. Their main concern is one of the two trippies, as she looks very young. She manages to produce her license, which takes a while as she has to push the vibrating fractal elves out of the way, and they then ask where she's going. I interject with home. Everyone's going to my home and staying. On the floor. They let us go. The rest of the event was held and questioned for hours until morning. It turns out some stupid ravers had broken into a neighboring building to spray paint a rude message, throwing the security system in the process. Story 3. Some background info for this. I grew up in a pretty rough town. We had a gang that at one point had forced the police out of several areas. After dark, most people avoid any parts of town the gang operates in. Well, a few years back, my sister and I spent at least a couple nights a week at a local music venue that rented space from a church. This association meant that some of the regulars were very religious, while I am not, which will soon be relevant. Anyway, we had the same routine every time. We stuck around for the shows, which ended between midnight and 1 a.m., helped clean up. Then us, some of the regulars, volunteers, and, usually, performers, would go to some 24-hour restaurant nearby. We'd get out of there between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock, hang in the parking lot and chat for another half hour, then go home and crash. So we go through this whole process one night, same as usual. And, as always, we started chatting in the parking lot. In particular, my sister, our friends Rick and Mark, and myself. While we're talking, we hear loud popping, banging noises from what sounds like a few blocks off. My sister and I recognize them, gunshots. Soon after, we hear police sirens. Not entirely abnormal in our town, so we just decide to keep alert. Then cars start flooding into the parking lot. About three people in each car. As everyone gets out, my sister and I notice they all have red bandanas. Some hanging from pockets, some wrapped around their head, one or two with the gang's adopted logo on them. More and more start showing up, all of them with the red bandanas. You see where this is going? My sister and I immediately tell Rick and Mark that we need to leave. Right, flipping now. Neither of them have caught on to why, so we inform them. Rick pales, hops in his car, and bolts. Mark, on the other hand, sits down on his car's hood and says, Nah, we'll be fine. I'm pretty surprised. For starters, Mark is not accustomed to the rougher areas of town. Religious, too. The type that usually runs screaming in our town when stuff like this happens. So, of course, I ask him why he thinks that. His response? Come on, man, if God wants me to pass away today, it's part of his plan. But it's not gonna happen. He'll protect us. I didn't know Mark very well before this. I had no idea he was so devoutly flipping stupidly religious. I'm stupefied, grabbing my keys and getting ready to say, fudge it, get my sister and I out. She leans into him, subtly points at one of the guy's bandanas and tells him, all right, you see those flipping bandanas? Consider that God's warning to you and get in your car, you flipping idiot. My sister and I got in our car and left. He followed, 
Fudge me, that guy was stupid. Story four. Edit. Sorry for formatting, I'm on mobile. One night after I got out of class, I decided to stop for a drink on my way home at my favorite bar. This bar was the quintessential dive. But the building had been around for nearly 80 years, so it had a lot of personality. Will this particular bar happened to be a major pit stop for the Vagos biker gang in my area. While I've been there, while it was packed full of them, I was never really worried about it. It was a, if you don't start trouble, you won't find trouble sort of thing. Anyways, this one night, it was only me and about 20 Vagos in the bar. They're drinking, shooting the cow, when the gung-ho ex-military security guard decided he would tell, not ask, them to move their bikes. This was taken as an affront, and the situation quickly devolved into one security with his hand on his gun versus 20 angry Vagos. They took it outside, at which point I decided it was a good time for a cane to mainly see what went down. I know at this was a bold, see dumb, move, but I was young and wanted to see how it all played out. The balls on this security guard must have been made of some space-age cow, because when the Vagos were screaming at him, Do you want to go home tonight? This guy responded, Do you want to go home tonight? Because when I pull my gun out, I'm shooting you in the flipping face. Well, after a lot of posturing and threats to each other's mothers, they eventually and calmly explained why they were both upset and squashed it. The Vegos ended up buying the security guard myself and all of the bartender shots to celebrate living. This situation screamed, get the fudge out of there, but I didn't, and got drunk for free with people that more than likely had a gang file. Story 5. I was smoking a cane behind a 711 when I heard multiple gunshots going off in the area. Given that I was not in the best area of town, I immediately thought probably just some gang violence or a robbery and continued to breathe my cig. The shots continue to go off, and after about ten shots, I start to realize this might be a little more serious, causing me to get in my car and get the fudge out of there as soon as possible. I go hang out with a couple friends for the night, and I get home to news about the mass shooting at Pulse, only to realize that I was about a block down the street smoking a cane when it first occurred. Glad I booked it before I could have gotten hurt. Kind of scary to think that this happened in an area where I normally reside and how big of an impact it's had. Story 6. Used to go into a pretty rough inner city area to buy large quantities of candy, which I would flip to suburban kids who couldn't get it anywhere else. The standard move was pull up to the bando, my connect would hop in, I'd drive him to his plug and wait outside in my car for a few minutes, drop my connect back off at his spot and go home. One day, usual routine, he tells me when to come through, so I do, and then he hits me with the yo, I'm on vacation, right not, but I got some of my boys on it, they'll take care of you. Then three pretty built dudes I've never met hop into my car. We make the bare minimum of small talk, and I drop them off to go pick the candy up. Naturally, out of all the times I'd done this, the one time I was dealing with complete strangers, someone pulls up on me as I'm in my car alone, waiting for the deal to go down, asking where I live and who I know. I mention the person I do know, so they ask where he's at. I have to say he's not here because he's not. They basically tell me that next time they see me, he better be with me or else it's going to be a problem. There wasn't a next time. I quit selling candy after that. Edit. Because people keep commenting the same thing, I'll clarify. I go pull up outside the trap house, if you want to call it that, and park on the street. My usual Connects associates leave my car and go inside. Some other people pull up in a car next to me and ask who I know. It wasn't the same people as the ones inside doing the sale. It could have been their friends or something, IDK. Story 7. 1991. Tower Theater in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. I went to see Jane's Addiction. The security was so tight that they wouldn't allow the crowd to form any kind of mosh pit. The crowd was pissed. The band was pissed. Finally, after six songs, Perry Farrell had enough. He shouted, this city needs an enema, dropped the microphone and walked off stage. After 20 minutes, we realized they weren't coming back on stage and many in the crowd began to rip seats off the old bolts on the floor and throw them. Then we ran outside and a group of 100 fans were rocking the tour bus, which was parked on a side street to the theater back and forth. I looked at my friends and said, this is about to get real thing ugly. And it did. But thankfully, I had the good sense to scram before all of the arrests happened. Story 8. Friend's 21st birthday. We were all at college right outside of Trenton, New Jersey. I'm the only 21-year-old. Another friend has the world's most convincing fake. And a third underage friend agrees to drive the three of us around. It's about 10 o'clock. We're going from bar to bar, but all of them are closed. After an hour of failing to get our friend his first legal drink, we're ready to give up. Our driver, Ned, speaks up. Wait a minute. 
I know a bar that's open 24 hours. We're interested, but he immediately follows up with, Never mind, I shouldn't have said anything. Forget I said it. We tell him to at least drive us there so we can get a read of it and decide for ourselves whether we want to go in. He refuses, says it's deep in Trenton and the cops don't go there. He worked with a lot of underprivileged families in Trenton and knew the seedier side. Us, being extremely inexperienced morons, insist we'll be fine and convict him to take us. We drive for half an hour into Trenton, and he comes to a stop at an intersection. There's boarded-up houses, a parking lot, and a shack no bigger than a garage nearby. Nothing else. Okay, we're here. We look closer at the shack. There's a small lit-up sign that says, Pass On's Nightclub, Passion's Nightclub. The eye had been shot out by a gun. And a large crowd of men were standing around the building, all wearing blue. Trenton had a huge Crips bloods problem at the time. We all immediately say nope and tell Ned to get the fudge out of there. But on our way back, I somehow convinced us to turn around. I don't know why. I was a flipping idiot. Ned drives us back and drops us off across the street with this warning. One shot and we're getting out of here. I'm driving up to the next traffic light, turning around and driving back. I'm waiting outside for five minutes. If you're not in the car, you're getting left behind. We walk up to the bar, three white-as-it-gets kids from the suburbs in the middle of Crip territory. A old man at the door tries to shake us down for a $35 cover, but his friend tells him to let us in. We walk in the door only to be greeted by a bulletproof window with a man on the other side with his head down, reading a newspaper. What do you want? I was first to the counter. Three shots, please. He looks up at us, then slowly takes his glasses off. What the fudge are you? I don't hear the rest of his question because a large gloved hand is grabbing my shoulder and spinning me around. I discover I'm not face to face with my friend. Instead, I'm inches away from a cop in full tactical riot gear. What the fudge are you doing here? He pulls me outside, where I see a SWAT van and police cars pulled up on the curb, all of the men in blue being frisked by cops against a wall, and the two friends who walked in with me being screamed at by another cop. He sees me and strides over to me. What the fudge are you doing here? Turns out, Trenton PD were set up for a full-on raid of this gang bar that night. When out of asterisk flipping nowhere, asterisk three white-as-it-gets kids from the suburbs showed up and ruined their stakeout. This was when Ned pulled up with a screech. And who the fudge is this? That's, he's our ride. He looked at Ned and at us and said, get in the flipping car and don't ever come back here. We must have broken the sound barrier diving into that car and getting the fudge out of there. Story nine, story time. I was young and foolish, living on the beach, and decided a midnight stroll on the sands was a good idea. It's my home, damn it, I can do what I want. So I'm walking by the water, and I hear this asterisk thunk asterisk in the sand around me. I look up. There's a group of drunk guys throwing rocks at me from a four-story motel. Now I have a temper, and it's not nice to throw rocks at people. My dumbass decides the correct choice is to shout up there that they need to cut at the fudge out. There's this weird pause like they had to process, and one shouts back, Hold on, bad person, we're coming down! At this point, my mind catches up, and all I think is asterisk, Oh cow, I need to get off the beach right flipping now, asterisk. All I had on my was my phone, I had walked there. So I kicked off my flip-flops and ran to the street off the sand just as this group of five dudes stumbles out the front doors. I know the area, so I ran full out till I lost them in a darkly lit neighborhood where I could call my dad to come get me. To this day, I have no idea what their plan was. Doubt they really had one. <laughs> Story 10. Many years ago, I was at a free back-to-school concert put on by the local alternative radio station at the Hatch Shell on Boston's Esplanade. Don't remember the opening acts, but the headliner was Green Day, then just starting out on their dookie tour. Needless to say, after a very hot day and plenty of beer, the crowd was getting rowdy. When Green Day finally came on, what seemed like the entire esplanade turned into one giant mosh pit. After about two songs, I saw the 30-foot-tall inflatable WFNX hot air balloon crumple to the ground, and the mood started to get really ugly. Snapple was one of the sponsors of the event and had been handing out free bottles of Snapple, which became airborne projectiles flying in every direction. Pieces of the railing in front of the stage started getting thrown around the mosh pit, which at this point easily comprised hundreds of people smashing into each other. I grabbed my girlfriend's hand and we scrambled out of the back of the crowd just as it started to turn into a full-fledged riot with helmeted Boston City cops rushing into the crowd just as the band fled the stage only a few songs into their show. 
And that, boys and girls, is the true story of Boston's Green Day Riot of 1994. Story 11. About eight years ago, I was living with a friend in a small trailer. There was a trailer a good ways behind us that the landlord eventually rented out to some guys. I was playing piece two in the living room one morning when one of the new neighbors knocked on the door. He introduced himself and we talked for a few minutes before he asked if I wanted to check out their place and breathe a blunt. I obliged. During the walk to his trailer, he randomly asked me if I know anybody that wants to pay for a hooker. I told him no and asked why. He said, this hooker just got out of jail and is staying with us. I just want to worker her out. This really disturbed me, but we were walking into his trailer by then. Inside, there is no furniture or anything aside from one room with a small TV and a mattress. A guy and the hooker in question were sitting on the bed watching censored photos on the TV. The guy that invited me over began searching all through his kitchen for what I assumed was the candy. Unable to find it, he proceeds to make a pipe out of an empty beer can and place a crack rock on it. He takes a hit and starts to pass it to me. I noped right the fudge out and went home. Next day, one of the guys stabbed the other guy and everybody went to jail, so they were evicted. Story 12. Was in the city center with my dad and autistic brother. We live in Northern Ireland, and this was around 2004. We were in a main shopping center when all of a sudden my brother had one of his fudge this, I am taking my clothes off moments, and immediately stripped his trousers off in the blink of an eye. He had some severe behavioral problems when out in public, most likely overstimulation. What we forgot to mention is that the Apprentice Boys, a marching Protestant group, were on a route that took them right outside the shopping center. Now being in a majority nationalist city, we thought this would have been diffused by a heavy police presence. Nope. While we are dragging our half-brother out of the shopping center towards the car, roars, shouting, and bottles were thrown across the barricades that were set up. So there we are, in the middle of a riot, dragging my disabled brother by each hand. My dad on one side, me on the other, and wielding his quickly discarded trousers with the other hand. Luckily, I think the riot distracted everyone from seeing two people drag a half-child through a city center. So it may have been the most perfectly timed public disorder I could ever had hoped for. <coughs> Story 13. I grew up moderate poor Mexican. Never had any cholo, Mexican gang friends, but knew friends of friends types. So about 12 years ago, this cholo-looking dude and I become unlikely friends at work. We joked, talked, and took breaks together. We were unlikely pals. He's five to one, neck, chest, and arms covered in tats, crooked nose from too many fights. Me! Five and ten ways he, no tattoos, never fought in my life, geeky, nerdy, thick Drew Carey glasses. One day he asked me for my number to hang out. I found it odd. Never had a dude ask me for my number. I lied and said I didn't have a cell phone. He looked me in the eyes, said, if you don't want to hang out, just say so, but don't lie to me. I gave it to him because he was intimidating. So he invited me to a house party. His homies would be there. I showed up. Totally the outcast. Everyone wearing colored bananas, Nike Cortez, Dickies, crisp, clean wife beaters, dark sunglasses, and various jailhouse tats. I feel all eyes on me. El Guero, El Pinching Narco. I thought I was going to get jumped. A big bad person approached me. Asked me, Que barrio? Essentially asking me what hood I represent? WTF? The music stopped. Beer bottles find their places. All eyes on me. My heart quickens. I think I'm about to get messed up up. Then my homeboy stepped up between me and the big Vado, told him I'm a guest, a guest of Chino Shark. I did not get my peach kicked. In fact, I gave my advice about pop-ups, virus protection, and general PC maintenance and care. Edit, bandanas, not bananas. But bananas makes them sound less threatening. LOL. Story 14. College party, underage. The host had no idea the party was going to happen. It was set up by her roommates. She was not pleased. The girl who set up the party has been talking cow to her two friends all night about the host. The host returns from work and is pissed. The two girls the party planner has been taking cow to decide to start some cow with the host. The try to fight her, but some guys throw them out. They're drunk and pissed off, so they go to get their boyfriends. Their boyfriends return with them and come in to try to start some cow of their own. Only it turns out the asterisk host's asterisk boyfriend is this huge bouncer who looks like he spends about 12 hours a day at the gym. These idiots try to fight him, and he fudge one of them up right off the bat, and we toss them both out and lock the door. Naturally, they decide to start trying to break the door down. One of them punches through the flipping glass. Dumb Peach is bleeding all over, but still trying to get in. Meanwhile, both of these girlfriends are cheering them on, even though they clearly see they are about to get their asses beat. At this point, the host calls the cops. 
This is when I turn to my also underage friend and say, we gotta get the asterisk fudge asterisk out of here. We head to the kitchen basement, and as we are headed down the stairs, some other guy comes running up the stairs, passing us, asterisk carrying mother flipping chef's knives in each hand. Now, panicking, we find another of our underage friends fall down drunk as fudge in the laundry room. We tell him what's going down and that the cops are coming, and we got a GTFO. He panics, stands up, and climbs over the washing machine to hide behind it, breaking some hose in the process, which would later lead to the basement flooding. But that's another story. Our friend will not come out from behind the washer, so we decide we have to abandon him and save ourselves. We climb through a basement window above the kitchen counter, breaking a little swivel fan in the process, and flee through several backyards until we find my friend's car. We speed off to a McDonald's down the street, trying to calm down, when we get a call from our friend who had hidden behind the washer. He'd followed us through the window after a few moments and needed us to come get him. We do, and then he realizes he'd lost his keys in one of the backyards, so we go looking for them. Eventually, we find them, and after a while, we head back to the party. The cops had come, arrested the guys trying to break down the door, and it turns out that one of the two girls had a warrant out for her arrest but she had escaped. We helped clean up a little. There was a lot of glass to sweep up because they had broken a few more windows and called it a night. Story 15. I was on a downtown B train in Manhattan. As we reached Grand Street, a fist fight that had been brewing became a reality. After Grand Street is the Manhattan Bridge, which takes a while, and then you're in Brooklyn, my destination. Destination or not, I wasn't going to be trapped in a subway car with two dudes trying to terminate each other. Perhaps I'm not as jaded and tough as real New Yorkers, but I got the hell off to wait for the next train. What was weird to me is how no one else did and seemed either to try to tune it out or curious what might happen next. Well, whatever would or did, they'd have six or seven trapped minutes to witness it. It was rush hour. I had to wait all of 40 seconds for the next train. People are weird. Story 16. When I was 14, I was invited to go to Toronto with my best friend and her family for the weekend. Another family, friends of theirs, were coming along as well. Due to not having enough space in the vehicle, my best friend and I took the Greyhound bus. It took us about two hours to arrive, but once we were there, we still had to terminate some time, as we were early and they were not. So we explored parts of Toronto. Finally, around 3 p.m., when they said they would be there, we started walking to the hotel and went to check in. Her family had not arrived. We figured they were stuck in traffic, considering Toronto traffic is the highway to hell during those hours, so we hung around and just chilled. Around four o'clock, there was still no sign of them, and coming on five, we were getting antsy, wondering what the heck was going on. We called a few of our friends who lived in Toronto to come and hang out, and so they did. And by the time we all met up, the other family joining us this weekend arrived. The father came along, and he asked us where her mother was, and in response, we said we didn't know because she was coming with him. He said he had gone to the house. No one was answering or even there, so he left and came here. From this point on, we were getting really confused and frustrated, but I noticed how he also kept closer to her than usual, kept staring only at her, and was way too calm about the entire thing. Our Toronto friend also noticed, and he came close to me and said, I don't trust this guy. We went up to the level we were staying on anyway, as the creepy father had said, I'm sure they are coming. Let's not have this ruined. Once we were up there, my best friend hurried to get to the phone and called her mother, to which she was almost shouting on the phone, You need to come home now. He never came to pick us up. After the conversation, sure enough, the father of the other family came in and was acting weird as ever. He then said, Well, if your mother isn't making it, I'll stay in this bedroom with you guys while my daughter and her friend can have the other one. As soon as that happened, I knew we were not staying there. So I took her out of the hotel, and our friends took us to their house to hang out, before my best friend's grandmother rented a car in order to come and get us. We were picked up at 11.35 p.m. So that's my memory of almost having to spend a night in a room with a pedophile who would have probably touched our coochies, or at least my best friend's coochie without consent. <sighs> Story 17. About five years ago, I was at a house party. We had all just discovered marijuana, so we're around 12 people sitting in a ring on the floor passing joints and a pipe. A few hours in, I mentioned to the guy whose parents owned the house that something is happening outside the window behind him. When I tell him that I'm seeing flashing blue lights, he doesn't believe me. And he refused to turn around to have a look because that would mean that I had gotten him. Yeah, he was the wrong kind of paranoid. After about five minutes of arguing, he finally caved in and had a look. 
Before this, he had been kind of blocking the window and it was dark outside. But once he looked outside, he instantly turned around and said the words, you just don't want to hear when you're doing terrible illegal sweets. Cops. We all panicked and started turning off all the lights thinking that the cops that was right outside would just assume that the inhabitants of the house suddenly disappeared. Most of us felt that it was best to just stay put and keep silent. Fudge that, I thought, and two others agreed. There was still one problem. The only way off the property was through the driveway, and, well, that's where the car with those blue lights was parked. The driveway was shared between my friend's house and another one, but the car was parked right outside the one we were in. With no better plan, me and the two others pretty much just walked through the door and got out into the driveway. At this time, we realized that the car was an ambulance and not the police. Whew. We keep walking anyway, though, because at this time we're already freaked out. I kid you not. Literally, the second we get out on the street, we see four police cars driving straight into the driveway we just escaped. And the last thing we see before turning the corner is an officer opening the door to the house. I didn't get to hear what happened until a few days later when I ran into the guy who owned the house at school. Turns out they had all sat back down on the floor and started passing joints again pretty much as soon as we had left. Not sure what led all those people to think that was a good idea, but they did it anyway. The officer had apparently walked right in, didn't even knock. He had appeared in the living room and asked who had called. Naturally, no one there had called any cops, and it turned out that the guy next door had a heart attack. They got lucky, though. The officer ignored the obvious cow that was going on, which is pretty fair considering what they were there for. Still, in the moment, I was pretty oh no sure I had just dodged being arrested. Never understood why they sent so many cops, though. And yeah, the guy lived. Happy ending. Story 18. Hello, Reddit. This is my first post. My story took place the summer after my freshman year of college when I came back ready and eager to reacquaint myself with some of the ladies I knew back in high school. I came up with a solid game plan of how to get some action. A pint of whiskey and a paid-for movie experience at the local AMC. Needless to say, we left the movie and went to where I had parked the car. In the back of the theater parking lot. Music was on, vibes were being put out. But then... A car pulled up next to us, two parking spots away. The guy who parked next to us did not get out of his car, but instead stared at me, intently, without breaking eye contact. He looked pissed off, but I knew I hadn't done anything, so I tried to ignore him. A minute later, he got out of his car, still looking at us, and went to his trunk. At this point, I still wasn't thinking too much into this, but I watched him as he walked over. Still looking at me, the man pulled out a black handgun and held it loosely at his side, still staring at me. Without thinking or looking behind me, I put the car into gear and gassed it as fast as I could. I, to this day, have zero idea what the hell that guy had in mind, but I didn't stay long enough to find out. Story 19. It was November 2015, and me and a buddy were backpacking through Europe and had just arrived in Paris. We're walking through the ninth arrondissement, and we decide to duck into a Chipotle, because we're hungry, and why not? So we go in, and I order a burrito in broken French, to the point where the girl taking my order is like, Let's just speak English. I can't help but think of how sad my high school French teacher would be. Anyway, I get my burrito and start going to town on it as all these police cars and ambulances speed past us sirens blaring. This burrito is fantastic, BTW. The tortilla is all wrong. It doesn't taste Mexican at all. It tastes kind of bready, but I know the French love bread, so whatever, I'll let it slide. The cheese is incredible. It's like a crumbly white cheese that melts in your mouth. I finish inhaling this mouthgasm, and we start backpacking to our Airbnb in the 10th arrondissement. We're passing all these bars and cafes, and people are partying it up as it's a Friday night. Then again, a convoy of police and emergency vehicles fly by, driving like bats out of hell through the city. I remember being like, wow, they weren't kidding about this European healthcare system. They really go all out. We keep hearing what sounds like firecrackers, and I remember that France and Germany are playing a match at Stade de France. People are probably celebrating with firecrackers, I figure. As we get closer to our Airbnb, we see people leaving bars and cafes slowly, even though it's a Friday night and it's only like 11 p.m. We even see some people run down the street, but not in a fun way, like running with a purpose. We finally arrive at our Airbnb, and when we get inside, the host urges us to get inside quickly. She tells us there was a bombing at the stadium and a shooting at a cafe just nearby. I remember not being too concerned. I'm from Los Angeles, so shootings don't really rattle me. I start unpacking, and she is checking social media and finds out that gunmen are taking hostages at the Bataclan Theater about a one-half mile away. At that point, we realize some serious cow is going down, and those sounds aren't firecrackers but gunshots. 
The date was November 13th, 2015, and we had just backpacked our way into the middle of the Paris terrorist attacks. P.S. If you're ever in Paris, hit up Chipotle. It's delicious. Story 20. My freshman year of college, my friends and I were wandering around the neighborhood near campus looking for a party. We ended up following a group of 10-ish upperclassmen into this one house. Pretty standard small college party. Cases of poor beer on the counter, a couple of liquor bottles around, people playing beer pong in the backyard and smoking candy in the basement. We make our way down to the basement since the upstairs was starting to empty out to head to a bigger thing. About five minutes after we go down, someone pulled out a crack pipe and offers it to us. It took us about 30 seconds to realize what the hell was going on and to get the fudge out of there. Eventually found the other party and vowed to not go back to that house. Monday morning, all of campus got a public safety email about the dangers of sweets. Apparently someone had reported it and like four kids got expelled lash arrested. Missed that by about a half hour. Story 21. At my dad's stepmother's house, stepmother babysat many kids on the regular. She had left for some reason, and my dad was at work, but would be home soon. Left us with two random potheads and another kid's mom who showed up earlier. I assume someone knew the potheads, but I can't be positive. I guess I forgot to mention the eight or nine kids. Me, my brother, my stepsister and brother, and four or five others, including one kid that we swore up and down was possessed. Lots of growling and biting on his part. We, being dumb kids, tried to give him an impromptu exorcism by quoting the Bible at him, which just made him snap and spit at us. Looking back, the poor kid was probably autistic with poor parents, which is a given, since his parents knowingly left their kids with our stepmother. We gave up on playing Catholics, and almost as soon as we do, we noticed someone was skulking around the house, eventually banging on the windows. Again, being dumb kids, my stepbrother opens the curtains of the window, which received the most recent bangs. Lo and behold, an angry middle-aged man with a shotgun, which is what he just so happened to be banging on the window with. Stepbrother falls back out of complete shock, I saw too. So he and I gather the other kids into the windowless kitchen. After we have them away, we go to speak with the adults. Their friend sits at the closed door to the bedroom smoking. Don't want to go in there, he tells us as we hear the other two adults banging bottoms. We explain what's going on, and he talks to the two in the bedroom for a couple minutes and comes out to calm the kids down while we wait, occasionally seeing shadows dance along the walls and banging. And it was not the two people previously having close relationship. We see headlights pull up, and after what seemed like an hour, my dad walks in nonchalantly, and the marauding shotgun man is gone. Come to find out, shotgun dude was drunk and going through a bad divorce, and his ex, kid's mom, was the one getting pounded like a fence post. Thanks for that, who's your peach fam? Glad my mom had primary custody. Story 22. I was deployed in Baghdad in 2009. I was driving one of three Humvees in a convoy from our FOB to an Iraqi office building to go sit down with some of their leadership. A dude pulls up next to us in what looked like a brand new Toyota Prado. Small nice SUV, he got out and just walked away. We were stuck in traffic. We couldn't really go anywhere. We all thought he was going to detonate a vehicle-born IED right then and there. We had a Duke system on. It's a frequency jammer that blocks cell phone signals so people can't blow us up as easily. The dude came back to his car, yelled at our interpreter to turn off our Duke system so he could use his remote start for his truck. On that note, we pushed through traffic and got the duck out of there. Story 23. Late to the discussion, but we e. When I was 19 in college... I was the lone male with a group of four girls headed to a house party thrown by a few guys I didn't know. We get there, and I'm so busy trying to keep an eye on the girls that I don't even realize that someone put something in my drink. My legs started to get really heavy, and I start to get disoriented. I not so covertly gather up the ladies in GTFO. I black out and collapse about a block from home. The girls called my roommate, who found me laying on the sidewalk and dragged me to my couch, where I woke up 12 hours later. I was fine. And so were the ladies. Story 24. I was driving back from college on a highway heading towards Baltimore, where there were, I think, five lanes of traffic. It was a few years ago. I don't remember exactly. There are police cars in the right three lanes with their lights on and a car in front of them. So I just assume it's an accident. So I slow down to merge and get over into the second to left lane. All of a sudden, a cop steps out in front of me and stops me and the guy in the left lane, blocking all traffic on the highway. Next thing you know, the cops are all positioned behind their cars, pointing guns at the stopped car on the side of the road. 
I called my parents immediately since I was terrified the person in the car they stopped was dangerous or something, and I was the first car in line closest to it. I honestly thought there was a good chance my car would be shot at. Eventually, the cops got the guy out of the car and wrestled him to the ground. I noped out of there as soon as I could, while the cars behind me crept forward to see what was going on. Story 25. So it was the year 2010 and I was on a study abroad trip in Malaysia. A group of us, five guys to be exact, are staying in a decent area of Kuala Lumpur in a nice hotel. Not a particularly shady region is the point. So we decide to go to a bar that is just across the street from our hotel for a few drinks after dinner, probably around 8 p.m. So we get in, and the first thing we notice is that there is a girl in a prom dress doing some kind of karaoke on a stage. Okay, that's strange. Next thing we notice is that there are scoreboards all around the stage showing various numbers. They all looked like NASCAR pole position scoreboards with numbers in red on one side, green on another in a long vertical stack. These girls would sing about two songs, then rotate off the stage, all in full puffy prom dresses. We never could figure out the purpose of the numbers, but we did realize fairly quickly this was some form of brothel. None of the wait staff had any interest in talking to us, though they were happy for us to keep buying $6 beers. Norm in Malaysia was $1.12 at bars. Anyways, to the I better get the fudge out of here spot. So we had been there about an hour, sitting towards the back of the sparsely populated seating area. We hear the door open and turn to watch as about 30 guys all dressed in black suits, black ties, black sunglasses file in and completely line the back wall. Not a word said, nothing stops, the staff just keep doing their thing, etc. Nothing changed, besides there were now 30 guys all dressed in what I would call a fed suit. We quickly got our tab, paid in cash, and got the fudge out of there. We still have no idea what was going on or how the scoreboards were being used. My best guess is a way of having anonymous bidding on the girls, but there was no order or pattern with the numbers. Nor were there enough people in the room to keep all the boards populated with numbers. We also didn't want to admit to being in a brothel, even if unintentionally, so we never asked anyone else. I'm just glad we got out and didn't get busted in some kind of international prostitution ring. Story 26. I was playing flag football this winter in a pretty intense nine-on-nine -nine league. The league allows stiff arms and full-on blocking. My team has a three or four guys that are 250 LBS plus, and we were dominating this team. A guy on their D-line got pretty upset after getting pancaked, so he got up in one of our guys' faces. This turned into a shoving match, and then one of their guys threw a bunch, and the refs called the game. Now that the game was over, a couple of their guys doubled down on their smack talk, and one of their fans came down from the stands and joined in on the smack talk. A fist fist breaks out, and then another. That's when the rest of their fans came down to back their boys up or whatever. All of our fans are our wives, girlfriends, kids, and golden retrievers. Funny thing is that they were now mostly fighting amongst each other. Most of our guys had left with their families. One of the fans then threatened to go up to his car and get his peace and settle this once and for all. I looked at my uncle, who also plays on the team, and we both raised our eyebrows and said, I think it's time to go. Story 27. Back in the year 2000 in Los Angeles, I was a little drunk with my buddy, and there was a cute girl at a corner and asked if we wanted to be extras in a film. We said, sure. She walked us down a few blocks with the other extras to meet the production crew who happened to all be Eastern European, and now the cute girls were gone. They walked all of us up the, the third floor where they were filming, and it was an empty room. Before we entered, I told my friend to follow my lead, and we asked to use the restroom. They escorted us to the restroom and had a guy stand at the door while we pretended to pee. I whispered to my friend this was really weird and to make a break for it. As soon as we finished, we said we had to go, and one of the guys actually tried grabbing my shoulder to prevent me from leaving, but we got out of there. We joke about it now, but we always wonder if we almost get kidnapped into a close relationship trade ring. Story 28. In college, I used to go to raves about once a month. I was actually quite responsible about it, if that doesn't sound like an oxymoron. I grew up a straight-laced kid from the burbs, so all of this was fun and new and exciting. Well, one evening at the club, I split from my regular group to hang out with these new friends. Always great to meet new people, right? Towards the end of the evening, probably around 3.30 a.m., a girl from the new group offered me some ecstasy. I honestly enjoyed the stuff, plus she was cute, so I heartily accepted. She then asked if I would like to go back with her group to a friend's house and hang since the club was about to close. How could I say no? The drive to her house was fine, as the effects of the sweets had not kicked in yet. But as we're walking into her house, things start looking funny. 
The girl's nose didn't seem to match her face anymore. One of the walls of the house seemed to move. Once inside, I could see every speck of dirt in the carpet and on the walls. The unorganized kitchen felt very awkward. I could see every detail everywhere. I thought, this is odd. I've never felt this way on E before. And then it hit me. I was tripping. I turned to the girl and asked what was going on. She sweetly said, oh, I forgot to tell you. Your ecstasy tablet was dipped in acid. It's called candy flipping. Fan flipping tastic. I had never tried acid before, and honestly, I'd never wanted to. My first thought, don't panic. The second one, find a place to sit, close my eyes, and ride this thing out. So I go into the living room, and it seems that there are a lot of really messed up up people on the floor, sitting up against every free spot along the walls. I, too, took a seat against the wall and hoped for it to wear off. After about two hours of crazy, open-eyed dreaming, I wake up to the sound of dry cereal being poured into a bowl. In the middle of the room, I see a little girl. She is sitting in front of one of those huge brown console television sets. She was watching cartoons as her pierced-up mother with green hair served her breakfast. Keep in mind, all of the zombie-eyed, passed-out people are still in the room. I was flipping horrified. The effects of the candy trip were fading, so I decided to book it out of there. As I made my way through the kitchen on the way to the back door, there were two guys standing on opposite sides of a kitchen island. When they noticed me, the room went dead silent, but only for just a second. They quickly ignored me and went back to their conversation. About money, about sweets, about who ripped off who. They started getting loud. Then louder. The intensity kept escalating. Now, asterisk in my head, I'm thinking, asterisk, this is the part in the movie where someone pulls a gun. Time to go. I awkwardly but briskly walked towards the, the kitchen island. Hey guys, I gotta go. Incredibly, they paused from their argument and I made my way out. I found my car parked in the yard and got the hell out of there. I didn't know where I was, but I knew it was not in a good part of town. After leaving, I got lost and couldn't find the highway. I was just about to bad person out. But thankfully, the voices in my head told me how to get home. Edit. Punctuation and a word. Edit two. The last paragraph is true. The effects of the sweets had not quite worn off. Multiple voices spoke in unison in my head, helping me get home. Story 29. Had the munchies, so I drove to a nearby gas station that's open 24 sevenths. It was about 1 a.m. As I park my car, a car comes screeching into the parking lot behind and stops at one of the gas pumps. About six guys wearing full black and matching a stereotypical gang appearances pop out the car and start yelling about all the bullet holes in the car. I then noticed that the car literally had smoking bullet holes in it all down the side. The breathe may have been the radiator or whatnot. I am not a car or gun expert, but either way, I decided it was best to skip getting snacks that night and instead drove back home. Story 30. It was in 1994 in downtown Vancouver. I was at a bar watching Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals with a friend. We were joking around during the game about a riot afterwards if the Canucks were to win. I remember telling him there's going to be a riot tonight, even if I have to throw the first brick. Haha, -ha, right? Anyways, the Canucks famously lost that game and we were pretty bummed. Everyone around seemed depressed, so we had another beer and a sullen silence before I finally said, Fudge it. I'm going home. I was a couple of blocks from the bar on the corner of Robson and Thurlow when the crowd started getting very aggressive and pushy. The reality of things turning ugly was not as appealing as the jokes we were making about a riot. People started fist fighting, yelling, just turning into a mob, really. I elbowed my way out of there and headed for the train as fast as I could to get home. It was only about 10 minutes after I left that storefronts started getting rocks thrown through them and rubber bullets from the Vancouver police started firing. That was one of the blackest days in Vancouver's history. Until 2011, of course, when I guess nostalgia took over and people really wanted to experience it all over again. Story 31. All right, fairly late and not nearly as exciting as some of these stories, but here's mine. I was in my sophomore year of college. I was 20 years old, so on a Saturday night, I was, of course, drinking at a party. This party was pretty good, really crowded, good music. At one point, the music stops and the lights turn on. Everyone at the party started yelling at the faceless person who had briefly ruined their good time, and the music got turned back on and the lights back off. I got this feeling like whoever did that was trying to warn everybody, but they got drowned out because the party was to rowdy. I found some of my friends and told them I had a bad feeling and we should go outside. Some of them listened, some didn't. We're out in the backyard for about 10 seconds before about three cop cars pull up. I and the several friends who stepped outside simply walked away out of the back of the backyard while everyone else scrambled to get past the cops. 
One of my friends got arrested, and so did about ten other people at the party. 